Hello, and welcome to the Dr. Money Matters podcast, the show where we discuss important financial topics that were never covered in med school. I'm your host, Dr. Tarang Patel. Okay, welcome back to another episode of the Dr. Money Matters podcast. Uh, this week, before we get started with our guest, Doc G., uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of the things uh, that have been um, uh, blowing up on uh, financial medical Twitter um, and uh, social media recently. One, uh, the biggest thing uh, was uh, a physician, a male physician from Texas who made uh, comments to the local medical journal uh, about uh, the pay gap in medicine and why he didn't think that uh, women, there was really a pay gap. It was more that women just didn't work as hard uh, and see as as many patients, uh, and that was the explanation. Well, that created uh, predictably a, quite a firestorm, and tons of uh, responses. It, I think uh, Dr. Esther Chu made a um, a response uh, to uh, to this physician on CNN. It was discussed on national news on other cable news networks. Um, but anyway. Uh, we have a discussion going actively on my um, Dr. Money Matters Facebook group. And the reality is, is that there is a pay gap. It's multifactorial um, in, in some places, such as the uh, military or and many hospital systems. It's not really a um, uh, it, the pay is a little bit more transparent. So, uh, you know, it, or it's productivity based. Um, and so. People can choose whether it's men or women uh, how their pay, uh, whether they want to work harder or not. But in other systems, uh, and even in academic systems, uh, sometimes salaries are not so transparent, um, and starting uh, salaries are are routinely uh, lower. Um, and that and that may just be because um, you, know, you know people don't know uh, the. Uh, starting point that they should negotiate at or, or um, you know, uh, whatever the reason may be. But uh, one of the goals of this podcast and, and several of the other uh, social media outlets is to increase the transparency so that we can all, uh, as physicians, uh, start our financial independence journey um, uh, better. So anyway, uh, I hope to uh, continue that discussion on the uh, Facebook, uh, Dr. Money Matters Facebook group. But uh, I just wanted to address it. Uh, there is a definite um, uh, gender pay gap. And like I said, we don't know all the reasons for it, but it's real. And so uh, I hope that, uh, you know, women uh, and they are, uh, especially on social media, are taking an active role in helping other women out uh, with this. Uh, and so I, I want to uh, congratulate and uh, applaud them for doing that. The other uh, social media um, uh, response, not quite as large, but still a, a, a pretty uh, significant one, was an article um, uh, featured on Doximity about physician on fire retiring, uh, you know, achieving his financial independence and return, uh, retiring early or, or has the option to retire early. And it drew a, a number of uh, comments from uh, physicians, both pro and con, predictably. But uh, the 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 negative uh, responses were quite surprising. Uh, some physicians saying, you know, he's depriving his children of opportunities. Uh, some physicians saying he's never lived through a significant bear market. So how, how is he going to be able to retire uh, on just a, uh, you know, a certain amount of assets? Um, and, and it's kind of a, a, a sad state when physicians are attacking each other for achieving financial independence. Whether he chooses to work or not is really his business. He has no obligation to work uh, to, in my opinion, he has no obligation to society whether he wants to work or not. Uh, just like society didn't have an obligation uh, to him. They did, there was no paying of his med school um, uh, by society. So uh, I think it's a different story when you join uh, an organization that pays for your education. You obviously commit to a number of years uh, of training and payback, but it, but just the average student going to medical school owes no uh, societal debt. Um, so, and if that's the case, then then maybe we should be making med school free for all, like NYU uh, recently did. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I just think that uh, let's not criticize each other as physicians for for those who are making prudent financial financial choices. 
Anyway, uh, today's episode is a little bit about uh, increasing the transparency uh, in finances. My guest is a physician blogger who blogs, un- blogs under the name Doc G uh, and is at diversif- diversefi.com. Um, and he talks a little bit about uh, how he achieved pretty early financial independence in what most people perceive to be a relatively low paying field of, of uh, internal medicine uh, in a competitive marketplace uh, uh, that Chicago, uh, the Chicagoland area is. So let's get started with Doc G of DiverseFI.com. This was, again, a long episode, so I made it a two-part episode. So this will be episode, uh, part one, and uh, please uh, listen for part two as well. Okay, welcome to another episode of the Dr. Money Matters podcast. My guest today is Dr. G of Diversify.com. He's an internal medicine physician who blogs at this website and talks uh, about financial uh, topics as well as uh, other, other um, issues in, in healthcare. And the reason uh, I was interested in um, talking with Dr. G, I've talked to a lot of the financial bloggers, uh, physician financial bloggers, but he rec- there was a recent uh, survey on Rockstar Financial that, that listed the, the net worth of, of the different bloggers in the financial space out there. And, and not unexpected, a lot of physicians were you know near the top of the list. But what was interesting about Doc G was that he was relatively young compared to some of the other uh, um, uh, people on the, the ranking, especially compared to some of the other physicians, and had a pretty high net worth. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, as we interview him. But before we, we get to that, uh, I want to introduce Doc G and welcome him to our podcast. So Dr. G, welcome. Thank you. I'm uh, excited to be here. So let's uh, let's talk a little bit about your. I mentioned your your financial your your blog, but let's just talk about you uh, your background as a physician first. So tell me, you're you're an internal medicine physician. So just kind of tell me what uh, what got you into medicine and uh, how you ended up in internal medicine. So um, you know, I've wanted to be a physician pretty much since I can remember. Uh, my father was a physician. He was an oncologist, and I really looked up to him and wanted to be just like him. Um, and you know, a sad story, but really part of my story is that he died when I was eight years old unexpectedly. So looking up to him and this idea of this eight year old, and this is what his father did. It really much pretty much made it concrete me this idea that I will become a physician. And so it's funny. I've never really considered doing anything else in my life. Uh, that's you know a lot of uh, physicians come from um, physician families. I'm not sure what the number is, but it's pretty pretty high. I, my myself uh, included. My my father is a physician, and it's one of those things that was always, um, you know, it was always something that I was going to do. I, I had some flirtations with some other uh, career uh, ideas when I was in college, but ultimately it came back down to being a physician as well. So. Yeah, I think that's that's a pretty uh, um, uh, common thing. I'm sorry to hear about your father, but I'm sure, uh, as we'll discuss, that that uh, impacted you uh, tremendously. So let's uh, well, let's just talk a little bit about that. So you 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 know you were uh, you mentioned in one of your blog posts about uh, being raised uh, in a frugal uh, uh, mindset. T- tell me a little bit about that and what you mean by that. So, you know, my mom and dad, um, as far back as I can remember, didn't really spend thri- frivolously. Um, but then when my father died, uh, my mom, this, the, the luck of the story, you know, if you look closely, you can find something good and lucky in every story. The luck of the story is my mom, who had mostly been a stay-at-home mom, had actually been in the process of finishing business school uh, here in Chicago. And so she was finishing with an MBA and a degree, a degree in accounting. So my father passed away when she was in her last month of school. Um, so she came out and actually got a job with one of the big 10 accounting firms, which actually in the, you know, this we're talking about in the early eighties was fairly unheard of. Um, women, especially mothers, uh, and especially people who weren't right out of college were not likely to be getting these kind of jobs. Um, so she came out and she had a good job and she had a stable income. 
but there was a huge fear that she wouldn't have enough to take care of us. Uh, in fact, she often told us, you know, her plan was that once we all got into college, she was going to sell our house, use the proceeds to pay for college, and that she was going to live in some condo or some rental somewhere. Um, so we grew up knowing that there was financial stress and strain just because she was a single parent of three young boys. On the other hand, you know, I never felt like I really wanted for anything. Uh, certainly, I always knew there was food on the table. We went on vacations. We lived in a fairly nice neighborhood. Um, but this idea of at least being savvy and being wary of spending money unnecessarily stuck with me. And my mom, of course, ended up being an accountant who ran small businesses. Um, so she was always very savvy about what made sense to spend money on and, and what you shouldn't. Okay. So it sounds, you know, it sounds like you, you in kind of, it was ingrained in you both from uh, your father and your mother, but then especially seeing the, you know, the challenges that a, a single mom has, that it was kind of ingrained in you. Did that, the, the frugality mindset, did, did that pass along to your siblings as well? Um, yeah, I think it did. Um, the first kind of half of my childhood, like I said, my father died, et cetera. Then my mom actually remarried um, and she married a businessman um, who helped develop other parts of me, too. But both of them were relatively frugal. Um, so I don't think any of us really ended up being very showy. Um, we certainly spend money. We go on vacations. We do things like that. But I don't think we ever make a point of, of being frivolous. Right. Right. OK. Well, th that's that's good. That's good. I think that's uh, one of the keys to um, this financial independence movement that we're going to we're going to kind of talk about here. But so let's uh, let's talk about the the the, the net worth uh, rankings or <laughs> uh, bl uh, blog roll, if you will, on Rockstar Finance. Um, you know, it listed you, uh, I, I want to say, third or fourth and maybe third amongst the physician bloggers uh, with the net worth. And I, I, obviously, this is kind of a self-reported thing, um, not verified, as um, I'm sure. But, um, you know, there's no reason to to not believe this. So you you are in your 40s. Uh, you, you, your your blog talks a lot about financial stuff and your net worth is six point three million dollars. So what I find interesting is a you know, that's a pretty high number for uh, no matter what um, field you're in. But it's it's obviously the the some of these uh, high income subspecialties, um, you know, can can achieve that quicker than. Uh, primary care fields, but you're in internal medicine, which is notoriously not on the high income level. So let's just talk about how did you get there? Uh, when, you know, what, what, what did you do to, to, what were your steps to go there? Were you consciously trying to get to a, you know, not necessarily this number, but, but to, to uh, a number which would allow for financial independence? So, you know, we can talk about specifics, but general, generally and philosophically, I think I came at my career as well as my own personal finances uh, from a few different directions. Um, one is I wanted to maximize my W-2 revenue. So, you know, I wanted to get into a position eventually where I owned a practice and then maximize what I made on that practice. But that was kind of only um, one one leg of the stool, so to speak. Um, the other part was I knew I wanted to do, I wanted to diversify in the sense that I also wanted to make money in ways that weren't specifically connected to medicine, or at least somewhat outside the purview of medicine. So I wanted to get into some side hustles, uh, just because I thought it protected my income better, um, as well as was another form of, of money generation. And then last but not least, I, you know, I thought a lot, of course, about spending. Um, unlike a lot of people out there and especially a lot of bloggers, uh, I wouldn't call myself frugal now. I would say that I spend things that have, I spend money on things that have value to me. Um, so putting that together, working on my W2 income, uh, working on kind of the side hustles and finding ways to make money outside of medicine and then, you know, paying attention to what I was spending on and saving a good percentage of my income. When you put that all together, uh, it gives you a lot of uh, fuel uh, for your rocket for your rocket to shoot up in the sky. And, and that's kind of what happened with 
uh, with my net worth. Okay. So let's let's talk a little bit about um, your timeline. So you, um, how long ago since you finished residency? So I did residency from 99 to 2002. 2002. Okay. So we're, we're about 16 years out. And then once you finished uh, residency, did you go immediately into private practice or um, did you, were you working for someone? So I uh, started actually working for a hospitalist group because I wanted to work in a specific hospital in a specific place. And the only thing available was a hospitalist position. Uh, and I hated it. <laughs> we could talk a lot about that. Uh, not not necessarily because being a hospitalist was bad, but probably because the company I was working for. After a few months of working for them, I was desperate to get out and actually joined the medical group of the hospital that I was working at. Uh, and I did this, I thought very deeply about this. I actually went back and forth and talked to a bunch of physicians and I was trying to decide, did I want to go into private practice immediately or not? What I learned from them and what I decided is that at that age, I felt like I needed a few more years of experience under my belt before I went into private practice and ran my own business. Uh, so I very intentionally joined a medical group thinking it was a short term solution do it for a number of years, gain experience, understand better how the business of medicine worked with the idea of eventually going into my own private practice. Okay. So, I mean, it sounds like, like you described, you're, you're, you have a very good mindset and a, and a systematic kind of approach to what you, where you wanted to be. Um, so you were, now was this all in, in Chicago, the, the, the general area, which is, tends to be a competitive uh, medical climate? Yes, yes, this is in the northern suburbs of Chicago where I live currently. Okay. So you you did that uh you know, you did that for a few years and then eventually like you open your own practice or you joined a practice? So the the progression was kind of when I joined this medical group and I wrote a whole blog post about kind of how to get from making X to 5X. So when I joined this medical group, I was making X and I remember you know, I started working and I, I really talked to a bunch of people in this medical group before and I joined them and they're like, you know what, there's no way you're ever going to make a bonus. You know, X is what you're going to make for the next bunch of years. Accept it. No one ever makes a bonus. It's really hard. And I kind of listened to them and then I started working there. And I say within about two years, I was making 2X. So what I found is, and I found this very often kind of in my own financial path, is people are always ready to tell you what you can't do. Um, and it's valuable to listen to them, um, but don't necessarily always take it as the truth, um, because often the people who are telling you you can't do something are the ones who either didn't bother to try or weren't able to do it. So I went from X to 2X. Um, and sorry, and that, said, that was I'm sorry, that was within the, the same group that you were already. Correct. So they hired me at one hundred twenty five thousand dollars a year in my first job in 2002. And I'd say within a year or two, I was making about two fifty. So um, why, what was the like, what was the issue with the other physicians? Do you think that that kind of precluded them from getting to two X even? Well, I think in a lot of ways they weren't willing to do what it takes. So the first thing I did is I, I joined a group of four other physicians. Uh, and when I first got there, I took over someone else's practice who wasn't particularly successful. So I had some patients, let's say I had two or 300 patients. The first thing I started to do is I told all the other people in the practice, look, you guys are totally overflowing. If you have extra patients and you need someone to see them for that day, you know, send them my way. I'll take care of the colds the blood pressures, the diabetes, whatever it may be. Um, so I had a lot of free time. I started seeing everyone else's overflow. Um, I would sign up for, let's say, 19 or 20 hours of clinic a week, but then I would come in early and be available at other times. Um, and you do what, what physicians are supposed to do. You, you know, you'd be, you be knowledgeable, affable, available. Uh, and if you do all those things, eventually the patients will come. Uh, and I'm a big fan of efficiency. Uh, that's probably why I've been able to build my income streams up is I think being efficient is really important. So I became very efficient at seeing patients. I became very efficient at, at getting my schedule filled at seeing them in a timely manner and appropriately. Um, and that just eventually led to a stream of patients. I worked this job from 2002 to 2007. And when I left five years later, I had about 2000 patients or so. Wow. 
Wow. Okay. So yeah, I mean, I, I, it does seem like obviously within medicine in general, there's a there's a variation in terms of productivity from individual to individual, but there's also a lot of built-in inefficiencies that we tend to uh, just accept, um, especially if you're not the owner of the uh, the practice. It, you know, a lot of people just tend to just okay, that's just part of it, and we deal with it. But it sounds like you were pretty proactive uh, in terms of changing um, some some of those inefficiencies, and then just you know, just flat out working harder um, and and developing that mindset. Again, you had this goal of eventually uh, leaving this practice. And so it sounds like your mindset was a little bit different probably than, than most of the other, uh, you know, the physicians who are working there. So let's go to, okay, so 2007, you, you, you finished working in this practice. Tell, tell me then, what, what did you do next? So by 2007, I was tired. I was tired of being told when to work and how to work. Um, I was probably the most successful physician in this five physician practice, although most of the other physicians had been there for a decade or two longer than me, yet I was being forced to take call for the emergency rooms and do all sorts of things that were painful. Um, and in a lot of ways, they wanted me to work hours. Sometimes I didn't want to work or they were asking me to come in Sundays when I didn't want to come in on a Sunday. So I was getting to the point where I realized my value. I realized um, that patients enjoyed seeing me. Um, so I started looking for private practice options. I started even thinking about opening my own practice. Uh, but at that time, a friend who was a pharmaceutical rep came to me and said, hey, I know this guy working, you know, a few miles down the road uh, who really has been looking for a long time for an internist. Um, and so I interviewed with him. Um, we got along really well. Uh, eventually, I started working for him with the idea of becoming a partner within a year, and that's exactly what I did. I worked for him. I had to build almost a whole new practice because it was far enough away that only a small percentage of my patients followed. Um, but I was able to kind of use the same skill set uh, to rebuild a practice uh, in this new community. And about a year into it, I bought into the practice, uh, which was more a formality. Um, where I practice, there's not a lot of huge buy-ins anymore. Uh, so I bought in for a small sum into the practice and then for the next bunch of years, uh, him and I worked together, uh, building a practice. We brought on some employees here and there. Um, and I built up my patient population again. Okay. Wow. Okay. So, um, when you started from 2007 and I'm, I'm going to kind of get into the details a little bit, if you don't mind, but so when you started from 2007, uh, you know, you, you left your practice, uh, previously that you were, you had become very successful at, you said you had 2000 patients, uh, and you'd gotten to uh, a certain income level. How, how long did it take you from when you started in 2007 to, to get back to that income level? Right. So when I left my practice over my first practice working for the medical group, they were paying me about $250,000 a year. And I was making another ten to 15000 a year doing medical legal work and some other things. Um, when I started the new practice, I started back at about 120, 130 a year. Uh, it took me, I think that first year with bonuses, I made about 180. So even though I was salaried at 120, I made another 50 or 60 bonus. Um, by the second or third year, I was probably making 300000 a year. Um, so I got to a point where I was getting between 2 and 3x, I like to say, right? So if x was 125 a year that I first started making, I was getting between 2 and 3x. Um, and at that point, I started doing what I call lazy side hustles. Uh, I don't use the word lazy because it means you're being lazy. I use the word lazy because... Side hustles can be kind of one of two types. They can be in a completely unrelated field, um, which is kind of difficult because you have to learn a new field or create a new product or do something completely different. What a lazy side hustle is, a lazy side hustle is a side hustle you can do on top of the job you're doing already, but you don't really need any new skills. So my first lazy side hustle was actually becoming a medical director of a nursing home. So I worked in an area and my patient population was growing and one of the nursing homes said, hey, we need a medical director. You're getting popular in the community. How would you like to come and see patients at our nursing home and we'll pay you a stipend every month to do that? That was a lazy side hustle because it wasn't a huge stretch. Certainly there were some skills I had to learn, um, but it didn't take extensive schooling or even studying. I kind of got in there 
learned about the administrative responsibilities. On top of that, the nursing home was sending me patients. So it meant my pop- patient population was growing and I was billing more. Uh, but on top of that, I was getting a monthly stipend. Um, so when I started doing that, start of in the third or fourth year of being in this private practice, that's when I started getting up towards, you know, 400,000, 450 a year. So that was when I started getting closer to 3x. Okay. So, um, so you're, you're doing your, uh, your, your regular practice. You, you, you've added on this nursing home. About how much uh, time was that nursing home uh, adding to your, your work week? Well, the actual administrative time, let's say, was about two hours a week. Um, but then I was also showing up to the nursing home and seeing patients. Now that added a lot more time, but remember I was billing for those patient visits. Um, so at some point, you know, I started in this nursing home, I started showing up as their medical director and they said, Hey, wait, you know, doc G you're actually coming in, you're seeing the patients, the patients like you, uh, you're paying a lot of attention to them. All of a sudden our hospitalization rate is not as high because someone's here and they're here often. Before I knew it, they started sending me 10, 20, 30, 40 patients, and I had a very busy population in that nursing home. Okay. Okay. So, um, so you're, you're definitely, you're, you're well on your way to, you know, significantly increasing your income from, from when you first, uh, started the one X time. Um, but, uh, your overall work time from, let's say when you started in 2002 at the first medical job, uh, to now, like, uh, or, or sorry, to, to this time period that we're talking about, wh- wh- how many hours a week do you think you were working at that point? Yeah, I, I would say I've worked a fairly consistent amount <laughs> for pretty much my whole career. I usually put in somewhere around 50 hours a week. Um, I will say, so what we're talking about right now is kind of the second iteration of my professional life and I'm now in my third iteration. So it's a little bit different, but I put in 40 or 50 hours of seeing patients and doing administrative work. I do end up answering the phone any time, day of night. So so if you add in that time, it sounds like more. Um, But the truth of the matter is, I found that especially these lazy side hustles just didn't add that much time to my day. Um, Often I could substitute time. I was sitting around in the office being, you know, less effective and go to the nursing and see five or 10 patients. Uh, and end up creating even higher billing. So, you know, in this situation, it didn't really add to my workload uh, much at all. Okay. And so this is something I'm, I'm a radiologist, so I'm not really quite uh, familiar with the nursing home directorship, but I've heard a lot of other physicians do that. Is, is that still a, a viable side hustle for uh, uh, internists and, and family uh, physicians currently? Yes, it, it certainly is. And in fact, I'm still a medical director of, of one currently. Um, it, it definitely is. The, the world is changing. It used to be that the nursing homes would just come after you because you were popular in the area. They thought, hey, he has lots of patients. He'll probably send us some. Uh, it wasn't the most ethical. Things have changed in that sense that now you've really got to bring some value to the nursing homes. Otherwise, uh, they won't really hire you anymore. Uh, the nursing home's bottom line has been tighter too. So every nursing home needs a medical director, uh, but they're going to want someone who's involved and who pays attention and who helps them. This is, uh, that's good. So, okay. So now we're in, uh, let's say 2008, 2009. Are you, you're still in this practice, um, and you're ramping your way up to five, five X. So, so tell me what, 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 what changes, you know, you're made in addition to what you had already described the nursing home and the other, um, lazy side hustles. So what happened is, you know, around 2012, 2013, I started really looking at my practice and a few things hit me. One is that my partner and I were very different. Uh, in the way we looked at our economics. He was always looking to borrow more and always looking to kind of live on the edges where I was much more conservative. Um, You know, he was always trying to pay himself first and then try to find a way to meet payroll, et cetera. So that was one issue. Um, In fact, I was, in some ways, I was very good for him because I balanced him out a little bit. Um, The other issue I was finding is as my nursing home business grew, uh, and I started having more than I had another nursing home that was interested in me. I took on another directorship. So I had two nursing home directorships. I had quite a few nursing home patients that needed a lot of care and time. And I would go do that in the mornings and 
you know, see 10 or 15 patients, then hit the office. And I realized that my time in the office pretty much was a zero sum game. I would spend all this money to actually support two offices, a bunch of staff, a biller, all sorts of overhead to then rush through and see 10 patients in the office and then do mounds and mounds of paperwork. Um, and I probably wasn't making any more money than I made in my first few hours of the morning seeing patients in the nursing home. So in other words, the office time I realized was very painful. The outpatient practice created a huge amounts of paperwork and a lot of non-billable busy time. Um, but it really wasn't giving me much of a return on investment. So in 2013, I did something that I would say was quite out of the box. I left my practice. I gave my partner actually a year's notice in 2012. And starting in 2013, I started a practice where I did home visits for about 100 patients. It was a concierge practice. I charged them a yearly fee uh, for uncovered services. Um, and I saw them in their homes. And then I spent the rest of my clinical time doing nursing home visits and being a medical director of a nursing home. And eventually I added in a a piece of being a medical director of a hospice and palliative care, which actually takes up quite a bit of my time right now. It's, that's that's interesting what you were describing there, because that is something that interesting. My, my my father is a psychiatrist, and he's you know he's been working for many years. As he was slowing down his career, he he kind of came to the same realization at a at a much later age uh, that his his outpatient practice really wasn't adding much uh, once you factor in all the overhead costs and. Uh, I would say five, six years ago, he kind of did the same thing where he shut the practice down, uh, you know, with his partner. Um, and basically, he's just doing the inpatient and things like that. And he said, I, it has freed his uh, day significantly, and um, it, it really hasn't impacted his, his income at all. So I think that's, that's pretty good. And for you to have realized that early on, I think that's, that's, uh, it's a good thing because there's so, so often in medicine, we tend to just get into this trap of just kind of doing the same thing and then maybe working a little bit harder, a little bit harder every year without actually analyzing some of the details. So I, I really, uh, you know, like the fact that you were, you were able to do that and kind of systematically analyze this, this and, and, and see, you know, and even if, whether it made a lot of money or whether it didn't, you, you kind of analyze it and then see where it's bringing you value. So, I think that approach is something that a lot of us could could benefit from. I, I guess I just I think that's really really a, a good thing that you did. Okay, that's the end of part one of my interview with Doc G. Uh, download uh, part two episode uh, to continue the rest of the interview. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Doctor Money Matters. If this is the first episode you have heard, I appreciate you taking the time out and listening and encourage you to listen to our past episodes. I would also appreciate you leaving me a positive review on Apple Podcasts and also recommend you join our Facebook group where we have ongoing discussions about this and other topics in order to help each other reach our financial goals. Finally, I encourage you to subscribe to our email list and also to subscribe to the podcast itself on the various podcast app that you use in order to be kept aware when the latest episode comes out. Uh, More episodes of this podcast are available at www.drmoneymatters.com and on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Audio versions are also available on YouTube and Facebook, and you can follow me on Twitter at drmoneymatters or on Facebook or Instagram at drmoneymatters, all spelled out. Thanks for listening, and if you get a chance, please leave a positive review for this podcast uh, as it helps uh, move the podcast up the rankings on iTunes and get it, gets it exposed to a wider audience. Thanks for listening once again, and stay tuned for another episode coming soon.